and some he's getting a little bit better at you know facing people, but he still prefers the rear. rear. The problem with that is that if he has to poop, he raises up and can shoot it about four feet. <laughs> so. But it is an opportunistic omnivore. It will eat anything and everything. And with that very strong beak, well, they can figure things out. They just don't learn by copying things. They can solve problems. The other thing is a tremendous amount of curiosity. But anyway, uh, in the springtime, uh, the bonded pairs will renew their relationship. Ben's the nest. And that's another thing that that great intelligence that ravens have, um, that they will be, they are able to identify other ravens. We have one in will our tree in the front yard. It, within the carnivorous diet. And great right owls, because they're not total hunters, need an extra tool. And yeah. that is yeah. even better vision than yeah. they have. Many, many more rods, and also much better placed in their eyeballs, in the back of their eyeballs in order to focus. When she locates it, she will extend her wings, fly over or just glide over, extend those talons, and grab. They are generalists, generalists as to habitat. They're also generalists as to diet. Uh, as to habitat, you can find great horn owls in almost any environment. You can find them here in the desert. Great horn owls will eat anything they can catch within that diet. Rodents, birds, Lizards, snakes, insects, anything that's available, they will eat. And you can find great horn owls wherever there's a good source of food. Now, I mentioned that there were stealth hunters. How she hunts? She hunts on the ground. She will come down on the ground. Mouth opening is called a gate. Uh, but with the ferruginous hawk, if you look closely, she almost looks like an eagle. The head almost looks like an eagle's head because he doesn't act like a falcon. He doesn't hunt like a falcon. He doesn't look like a falcon. Marions, <laughs> you will see them dining with the vultures. And actually, they can be a little bit of a bully sometimes and into South America. Yeah. Right? It's a very, it's not just that enclosure that shelters that's awesome right now when they're home and they're getting the rest of breakfast or whatever else they need the ravens go home and when they have enrichment items they have legos they have food puzzle they have mealworms they have all these because they need that extra stimulus right where other guys you know and certain enrichment items they'll just leave alone so yeah there's more aspects to it but it's very easy to just say oh it's only food well you saw them they're fully flighted why do they stay here right they, they have just take off they could but there's no reason to it. So yeah. you, there's so many other factors, right? They're against the great horn owl. Gotcha. So they're very not, like I mean they can see in a sense, but they there's not they any cons yeah they do because why would you be want to sit next to the apex predator <laughs> at night and right. go to sleep and that one's active and you're like oh it sucks <laughs> like no we do what's right you know when you see this it's the same level of thought that goes at home so um, yes they all have individuals enclosures but when you're out in the space and you see them disappear and I'm sure you're wondering how that works well they're crate trains I watched a plane go from that side of the sky until it was gone for nine minutes oh and it was gosh. I remember because at that point your poor narrator has nothing else to talk about so <laughs> but when you're trying to talk about when you're actually waiting to actively make that decision but it's a natural behavior mm -hmm. we're not asking much right they're already inclined to do it you're just waiting for them to show that level of interest you see that and that's again they go all the way to the back they can go to the back and they're sitting in front and it's great because you'll have the volunteer check in and be like oh yeah she's just running around the crate like I'm not ready to go home yet <laughs> uh, and then Dante you know and you have situations like that where if that was a volunteer scenario the Ravens have gotten good enough to land on the pouches they could unzip it real quick grab the food and fly away <laughs> so yes everything's visual and you might have seen people waving in the back, but that's again, we're trying to get them to fly in in their natural setting. This show is not about us, the demonstration, right? It's about the wildlife, these guys that you find in the region. Dante's back, I noticed. The little a antenna? Feather, or is that a, constant, a, a calm thing with other ravens? The, actually, on his back, he might have been, he actually has radio telemetry, it's a giant antenna. <laughs> The view from the top, you know, I'm too excited on just the back. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Switzerland, we have frog season where they cross the road. Oh, really? And they put up little green plastic barriers. Oh, my God. So they won't get run over. Oh, that's so cute. Him. Or her. Him or her. I think it's funny when all of a sudden they jump up. Oh, yeah. We had one. Oh, there's also oh, another one came out. Oh, you're away there. The way you came, Carter? Yeah, we went through here and went that way. Oh, okay. And then there's another exit, but I don't know. They are so fast. would not hang out here if I were you little squirrel. I think it looks like a squirrel. I think it is a squirrel. Yeah. Oh. Okay, you know what he is. He's dinner. Put it around my shoulders. <laughs> That's cool. Oh, Alexander would love this. Tongue in his mouth, and then there are these two little pits on the top of his mouth. 
He's going to press the forks of the tongue into those pits, and with the help of the Jacobson organ, be able to process what he's smelling. Anyone have any ideas of why they may be called king snakes? It's said that they are the king of snakes because they will actually eat other snakes. The reason that king snakes, common king snakes in particular, my favorite non venomous snake, is that they will actually successfully predate on rattlesnakes. So these snakes won't even actually constrict rattlesnakes. Let's say Monch is out slithering around, picks up the scent of a rattlesnake. What he is going to do is approach that rattlesnake head on, bite down on the head so the snake hopefully won't open its fangs and hurt him, and then swallow that snake whole alive without constricting him. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. I think it's pretty neat. The meal is like having a coupon. I don't have to work for dinner tonight. What he doesn't know is that that my mouse actually recently consumed a pellet that has poison in it. Found on the floor, but they often will spend time up in trees as well, meaning that they are an arboreal species. She has a tiny little face, but she has small eyes, and she's nearsighted. She relies most heavily on her sense of smell. Let's see if Ru can show us that she's an arboreal animal in addition to how she's using her sense of smell to find some snacks. And drop some snacks. <laughs> uh, these porcupines, in addition to being our arboreal animals and nocturnal, sometimes you'll see during the day. Right now, even though she does not much show up, she <laughs> erects her quills, which are about two to three inches long, and then she will also raise those long guard, guard hairs to make herself look bigger. <laughs> Other things she may do is she's gonna stop her feet, she may chatter her teeth a little, she could potentially charge, and if none of that works, she's gonna turn it around and whack whatever that threat is <laughs> with her tail, which is where those quills are most heavily concentrated on. <laughs> that sort. A coyote may mess with her, but a coyote is gonna learn very quickly that it is not wise and it's not worth uh, having quills in their mouth. What line, uh, excuse me, mountain lions have actually developed a very unique way of hunting these animals. They get along, they're just not interested in interacting with each other, really. Yeah. <laughs> not unusual. Yeah. But we don't, we don't breed them here. Um, yeah. Are you ready to go again? We used to have the Santa Cruz River had flowing water. The San Pedro River, which is west of here, had flowing water year round. So the great hub, but they, as I mentioned before, about 10 breeding pairs were coming up to breed here. It's not only do they need water, but they nest in high trees, they nest in willows, they nest in cottonwoods. And when they come in, it's fascinating. I have never seen one in the wild, but I have heard them. Uh, you can see them in the Patagonia area, southeast of here. Their call is almost like a peacock call. It's very loud. You hear them very well. And you can follow uh, where they are in the tall trees. You can see how they move through the trees. Actually, you can hear how they move through the trees. And, but like I said, I have never seen one. Usually they're not as agile on the ground as some of the other birds that we have. She will fly very close to you over your head and you will not hear her. You will make you feel the displacement of the air as she's flying through, but owls are silent flyers. And the reason that they can fly silently is because of the structure of their feathers. First of all, they're extremely, extremely soft. Think of a powder puff. And the other thing that makes them uh, silent, like silent, <laughs> is they make a lot of noise as they twirl around. So, uh, silent studies. Now, hunting at night, as I mentioned, uh, you need additional tools. But the barn owl is even more extraordinary in the sense that he can uh, hunt a rodent in a dark room. They've done it many times. And that, those owls were able to find that mouse in absolute darkness. I think the percentage is around 90%. So it's a very effective tool to keep those little feathers moving and direct the sound waves. Now, I did mention that owls fly silently, that they're stealth hunters, and you would think that they would not be squawking like she is, like he is. And what you're hearing is something called And they are uh, discussing things right now. But as I said, with any family, they have to be a leader to show you how agile they can be. They can be very maneuverable. And the other thing that you may have noticed is how distinguishable they are from other hawks. 
uh, the pattern of their feathers is very easy to see and be able to identify. Their body feathers are dark brown. Look at the shoulders and the underwings. It's a very beautiful brick red coloration. But what really gives it away is that white patch on the rump that you can see whether you're looking up at them or down at them. And also the white banding. Then you have one wolf leading and chasing, leading the chase. That would be one of the lower ranking birds. And to talk a little bit about the hierarchy of the Harris's hawks, that alpha female that I mentioned is the top bird. She will have a concert that will be an alpha male. There will also be another male that is a beta male. And the remaining birds in the group, and those groups can range between three to seven individuals normally, those are the lower ranking birds, and they are the, called the gamma birds. They're looking to see if there's anybody that doesn't belong to the group coming by, and they're looking for food. So after doing that, and we have a relay chase going on because one leader changes position as uh, when he gets tired, um, they will follow something. Now, with a relay chase, it may end in an actual hunt where they are actually able to catch that rabbit. Remember, 50% success rate in hunting as a group? Uh, or that rabbit may get smart and get hide and go hide under a bush somewhere. And then we will have something completely different. It's called a pounce hunt. And what they will do is they will sit around surrounding that bush. And now remember, the alpha female is the leader. So uh, they will wait for her to give a signal to one of the lower ranking birds to go down and chase that rabbit out from under the bush. Again, the female will lead the family, will uh, take care of the family. At that time, when that rabbit makes the mistake of coming out from under the bush, they will pounce and therefore will do something else that hurting another member of the family is not a good idea. You know, sometimes you will see discussions and squabbles, and it sounds like they're going to kill each other. They sound horrible. Like I said, they came up here about 125 years ago, but now you can find over 40 Harris's Hawks family. If it was a family, bird touches a hot wire, the entire family will get electrocuted. Now, Tucson Electric has been very good. If you see something like that happen, the museum and volunteer our time uh, to interpret the Sonoran Desert region or whatever area you come from. We're now open for questions, and I thank you so much for being here with us today. I hope you have enjoyed your day at the museum.
you. Along the back. That was exactly look at No, that's exactly what ain't gonna happen.